Hello and welcome to Walking in the Word. Today we're going to continue our series on spiritual mentoring, taking the lives of Judah and Benjamin, who were brothers, as an example to apply principles of mentoring that even work for us today. So Alton, where would you like to start? Well, last week we kind of ended with talking about how many of the great men of God were shepherds, Moses and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Abel. They were all shepherds, and it seems like it's a prerequisite to learn how to handle flocks of sheep if you want to end up handling flocks of God's people. And sheep exhibit a lot of the same kind of things that people do. They if you're not careful, they get yourself in a lot of trouble. They have a lot of predators around trying to get them. So the shepherd's an important person. And David was a shepherd. And he was put in charge of his father's flock. And, you know, if, you've, if you know any shepherds, I've, I knew a few when I lived in Idaho for a while. And they, it's a lonely job. You're out there in dark at night watching for predators. And there's a lot of time on your hands, you might say. And so David had a lot of time on his hands. And he didn't just waste it. He communed with God. And he wrote all those psalms because of that connection with God between, between him and God's heart. And so um, he was being prepared. And also he had to be ready at any time to put himself between any predators and those sheep. And that's what Jesus did of the tribe of Judah. He put himself between Satan and us. And he took the hit that we had coming to us and took all that punishment and everything that you saw in that movie, The Passion, that happened to Jesus. You and I had that coming to us. That was, when you talk about God's wrath, he already has exhibited his wrath on Jesus. All we have to do is appropriate that and come under it and so he was our the substitute for us so now when we talk about David learning all these aspects of being a shepherd you know it says in Hebrews 5 8 that Jesus um, learned obedience through the things that he suffered and that word suffered you know we always think it's, it's a painful, always a painful thing. Well, it's, it, it can be, and it can also be something of a learning experience. When you were a child, maybe you remember being in school and you heard the kids outside playing and, and it was springtime and everything was, seemed like everything that was fun was going on outside and you were inside. And so... You were, at that point, suffering, <laughs> okay? Uh, but it was for a good cause. You were learning something that you were going to need later. And so when you think about David, okay, when you think about the Lord, learning obedience through the things that he suffered, okay, that, that kind of lamb is called the Paschal lamb. From the Greek for Paschal, it means uh, passion. It means suffering and pain. But it's for a purpose, not just to suffer and, and hurt. There's a purpose behind it. And so David was learning and learning and learning. And so he fought his lion and his bear, and he delivered the lamb out of the mouth of it. And so I don't know about you, but after tangling with a lion and a bear, you'd almost think Goliath was a little bit easier 
Of course, he was nine and a half feet tall, covered with all kind of armor, and that's Satan. He always wants to make himself seem bigger to you than he is, and he always comes to you over ready, you might say. He, he has all this armor when he doesn't even, uh, he comes to a, a little little David, and he has all this stuff on him. You'd say he was over prepared, but Satan knows that God is way more powerful than he is, and he always comes trying to overplay his hand. You know, he'll heat up the oven seven times hotter when once he'll do the job, you know, and and he'll come with all this pounds and pounds of armor, but none of that matters to God. He can walk right through any of that. And so, you know, when Saul, who was the king, he's the one who should have been out there fighting him. But he didn't have anything backing him up except his armor. And he tried to let David have that armor. And David said, I haven't tried that. I know what I can do when God is with me. But this armor, if it was working, you'd be out there with it on. And you don't seem to have much confidence in the old way of doing things and in the way people have decided was a good way to do things, this armor is, is not good enough. So he took it off. And we find out that when it comes to a battle, when God is in, in on it, size doesn't matter, experience doesn't matter. They said he was a... He's been a warrior since his youth, and you are just a youth, okay? And he had tremendous sword and spear and everything. And I kind of got a chuckle one day when it occurred to me, we always have this saying, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. And that's what's, what Goliath did, because what David had was, tantamount to having a firearm, he, his arm was on fire. And he slung that stone and then used Goliath's own sword to kill him with. And so it was faith that was going to do this. But Saul didn't have that yet. He did not, he was, he wouldn't even listen to God when he asked him to do simple thing. And so the that shows a lack of faith because the word faith and obedience in the Greek and in the Hebrew is the same word. Okay, if you don't have, if you don't obey, it means you don't have faith. You're not, that word means you're persuaded. So if you're persuaded that God's way is the way to go, then you'll obey him and do what he, he uh, asks you to do. But if you don't have that faith, if you're not persuaded, then you'll disobey because you don't want to lose, okay? David also made a statement. He says, he called Goliath this uncircumcised Philistine, okay? What he was saying was circumcision was the covenant God gave Abraham. David had a covenant with God. Goliath had no covenant with God. So he already had one strike against them before he ever came together in the actual battle. Okay. The first battle with, you have to understand, when Jesus died on the cross, he faced down Satan and defeated him. Exposed him for what he was and in so doing, that's how he beat him, okay? Um, so this first battle between Israel and the Philistines was a one-on-one. -on -one. It was just David and Goliath. And so it's amazing because David wasn't cowering or hoping that he get a lucky shot in or something. He ran toward Goliath. 
and he prophesied. Okay, Goliath was trash talk, talking, but David was prophesying, this day I'm going to give you over to the fowls of the air. And then the next verse says, and it came to pass. That means it was a prophecy, and it came to pass. And so, um, you know, when David first came, he said, fear not, ye men of Israel. I'll go fight him. That word for men there is Adam, Adam, the red earthy man, okay? The man that doesn't recognize God, thinks he's got it all figured out, and is going to do it on his own. And all of a sudden you're faced with a Goliath and you don't know what to do about it. And so David knew what to do about it. He already had been there and done that, got the t-shirt. And so he goes and fights Goliath, cuts his head off. The Philistines see their champion is dead, and what do they do? They flee. David takes off after him, expecting these men of Israel to follow him. And they did. And all of a sudden, you see a change. When Jesus died on the cross, he was the last Adam. Nobody has to be an Adam anymore. All you have to do is come under his what he's provided for us. And so it says the ish, the men of high degree, rose up. Okay? That's the same kind of word as you see, arise, shine, for the light has come. They rose up. It's a... It's a resurrection word. And they rose up and they pursued after the rest of the Philistines. Because when Jesus died on the cross, there's still a lot more stuff has to be taken care of. Sin has to be taken out of us. And, and all of it, the minions of Satan have to be dealt with. And it's, it's so um, this next battle was a corporate battle. And now we're in place where there's a body of Christ fighting against the host of darkness and don't worry read the back of the book we win but it was funny because you know Israel needed to learn who their God was and David said before he even fought Goliath he said in all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So talk's cheap, but he produced. And so now they understood. It was an experiential knowledge now, not just something, a nice testimony or something. They saw it for themselves. And so the men went from being Adam's to Ish. The plural is Anashim. So they, they went from being Adamic nature to low earthly men to men of high degree, just like that. And they chased the Philistines all the way to Ekron, which was one of their major five cities of the Philistines. And it means uprooting, obliterating, annihilating. Okay, so they chased them all the way to that. And then it says that they returned. The children of Israel returned. That word children is the word ben. Benjamin. They came back as sons. Okay, they, they just got a big promotion just because of what David did and then, and then them following him. And so we, have, we understand now that when people are, uh, when the Lord died on the cross, he opened up a floodgate for us of possibility. Now we can fight sin. We can get rid of sin and we can become sons. Those that received him he gave the power or the exousia to become the sons of God. 
And, and isn't that wonderful? You know, we have a hang-up sometime with male and female in the Bible. When he says man, he means everybody. When he says sons, he means everybody. So, we're not, they're not trying to eliminate the ladies. In fact, we're making sure you understand that you're up there with the men. It's There's neither male nor female in Christ. So get yourself in Christ. Now I'm going to have my beautiful wife continue in this. I'd like to pick up with 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 1 and focus mainly on the brotherly relationship that developed between Jonathan and David. Keeping in mind, again, Jonathan is a Benjamite. David is from the tribe of Judah. So 1 Samuel 18, 1, this happens, this event happens right after David had killed the Goliath. He, had, he came in to Saul's tent, David did, with Goliath's head in his hand. So verse 1 says, And it happened when David had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was joined, and the King James Version says knit, which means by definition tied mentally in a league. So he was knit. He was joined in agreement and one heart and soul with David. Jonathan loved David as a brother as he loved his own soul and Jonathan and David made a covenant, and that word actually has the same meaning as knit. It means to form a league. Made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And so we have peers, one from Benjamin, one from Judah, who are mentally making an agreement or a league or a covenant. And in so doing, Jonathan gave him three covenant gifts he gave David his robe, his weapons, and his girdle. And so you may think, well, that's nice. What does that mean? In doing some research, there's some very, very important, significant things that those three covenant gifts represent. So I want to explain them to you. The robe, the definition for robe means cloak or mantle. So think about that. We know what a mantle is in the body of Christ. It's a position. And so in this case, it was a royal robe. Jonathan was the prince. So his robe represented a position of royalty that he gave David. He also gave him his garment. His garment. You could say he gave him the shirt off of his back. But it's even deeper than that. Again, remember, Jonathan's position in the kingdom, he was both the son of the king, he was a prince, which means he was the rightful heir, and also he was a military man. He served as a warrior in the army of Israel. And so this word garment represented his military uniform not just the uniform or the garments of war, but also the honors, the medals of victory would have been a part of, attached to, somehow displayed on this garment. The Hebrew definition of the word garment sheds a little light. It means his height, his stature, or his measure. It also can mean his judgment, his ability to judge. So there's a whole lot more involved in this garment and in this royal robe than what may meet the eye. So in doing what he did, in stripping off his royal robe, look at the significance of this. He was the one recognized by all, Jonathan was, of being the heir to the throne. When he took his robe off and he placed it on another man, Think of the significance of that. Symbolically, he was saying, David, I see that you are the one that's the rightful heir. I'm giving you my royal robe. He took his garments of war, his uniform off. 
He gave it to David. I'm handing you my victories. I'm handing you my honors that I have won. He gave him his weapons. He gave him his, his garments and his weapons. The sword that he gave him, if we look in 1 Samuel 13, it's explained that in Israel, because they were under the thumb of the Philistines, in Israel there were only two swords. The Philistines would not allow blacksmiths in the land of Israel because they didn't want them forging weapons against them and overcoming them. And so there were only two swords in the land. One belonged to Saul, one belonged to Jonathan. So again, this symbolism is very powerful. When he handed his sword only one of two among Israel, he was saying to David, I give you my self-defense. I give you my ability to defend myself, and I surrender that to you. I give you even permission to use my own sword against me, David, if that is what you desire to do. And so that was an act of submission, tremendous act of submission by a man of war. If you look in 2 Samuel 1, you see the significance of Jonathan's bow. It said that Jonathan's bow didn't retreat in battle. In fact, he was a man who was renowned with a bow. So not only did Jonathan give him his valued sword, only one of two in the land of Israel, he surrendered his bow, his prized weapon of war, to David. And in doing this, in all of these things, so far you see that he is literally handing over the kingdom to David, him being the rightful one to, to be the heir of the throne next. He's handing that over to David. And we don't want to forget the girdle. And no, ladies, don't think about what you think about a girdle. A girdle is simply a belt. But in this case, the girdle that Jonathan wore was a military belt which held his sword and his bow. And it wasn't just any belt. It was an, or, an ornate belt. It had designs. It had special weavings that showed the status of the one who wore it. His girdle was unique. It, is showed, it also showed his accomplishments as a warrior. And it was given to soldiers for bravery. So he had earned this belt. He had earned it as a successful warrior, and he handed that as well. The thing that held him together, he gave that to David as well. The prophet spoke of the importance of these garments and these elements of war. When he spoke in Isaiah 11, he prophesied, and this prophecy applied to David, obviously, but it applies to us just as well today as the offspring of the lion of the tribe of Judah spiritually. Isaiah 11, 1 says this, There shall come from the rod, a rod, there shall come a rod from the stem of Jesse. That, of course, was David. There shall come a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow from his root. Well, guess what? The branch was Jesus, who is the Christ. Not just Jesus, the head of the church, but his body all together. And a branch shall grow from his root, verse 5 says, and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. Again, Jesus and his body, the head of the church and his body, the body of Christ. Righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness shall be the girdle of his heart. So again, we know the significance of a belt or a girdle. This is what, the, what Isaiah prophesied. And then chapters 60 and 61 of Isaiah are just as prophetic for us as they were for David. In chapter 61, verse 3, he starts out the chapter, by saying, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Well, if the Spirit of the Lord is in you, is part of your life, 
then this applies to you. And verse 3 says, To appoint to those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and then watch this, the garment, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And you think about the life of David. What was his first assignment in regards to Saul? He would come in and he would play his harp and he would soothe Saul. The garment of praise would lift off that demonic spirit that harassed Saul. Garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And then Isaiah 61.10 he says, I will greatly rejoice in Jehovah my soul. My soul will be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the robes of salvation. He has covered me with the robes of righteousness, like a bridegroom adorns herself with her jewels. So Saul was aware of Jonathan's Brotherly, brotherly love with David. He was aware of that. And he surely saw the gifts, the significant covenant gifts that Jonathan gave to David to link Judah and Benjamin as tribes. Saul knew that God was also with David. He saw what God was doing, how he was promoting him. And he knew that his son had chosen David to replace him as king. So once again, Saul's jealousy grows against David, the old Adam man, the old Adam nature shows up, and he desires the life of David. But Jonathan intercedes, and in 1 Samuel 19, 6, it says, Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, as Jehovah lives, lives he shall not die. But then once again, 1 Samuel 20, 42, Saul is determined to kill David, so Jonathan sets up a system. He delivers a message to him in a field to let him know whether he should come back to the city or he should flee for his life. And so Jonathan delivered the message. No, he was to go on. He wasn't to return with him to the house of Saul. So Jonathan makes this statement. He says, go in peace because we have both sworn in the name of Jehovah, the Lord shall be between me and you and between my seed and your seed forever. And then David rose and went away, and Jonathan went back into the city. Now, this was fulfilled. Jo David made good on this promise. This was fulfilled because after Saul and Jonathan fell in battle, David became king in 1 Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel, actually, chapter 9, verse 3. David said to a servant, Is there any left of the house of Saul that, so that I might show him kindness and show the kindness of the Lord to him? And the servant said, Jonathan had his son who's lame in the feet. And King David sought him and brought him. Mephibosheth was his name. He was the son of Jonathan. He fell when he came before David. He fell on his face and bowed to him. And think about the history that had taken place. Saul spent years pursuing David to kill him. And so, of course, Saul's grandson would think the obvious. David the king is bringing me in to see him. He's probably going to kill me because of the evil that was done against him by my grandfather. So he bowed before David, and David said to him, Do not fear, for I surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake. He was making good on that covenant that was made as the two men parted. I will restore to you all the land of Saul. What an evidence that David didn't hold any grudges against Saul. He was going to give Saul's grandson all of the land that belonged to Saul. And you shall eat bread at my table forever. So today, hopefully you've, you've seen the picture that God was forging and had forged by this time a covenant relationship between Judah and Benjamin. And Judah is once again showing Benjamin how to be a man of God, how to be a king, how to function by the leading of God's 
anointing in God's spirit, in God's guidance, instead of by the Adam fleshly nature. So we trust that this has blessed you today. We send our love to you in Jesus' name.